So how are these new drugs discovered? Well, option one is just plain old serendipity, so coincidence. And uh, one of the uh, most famous stories of this is the story of the discovery of penicillin. So Sir Alexander Fleming is the uh, man responsible for discovering penicillin. And he was actually working with staphylococcus bacteria. He was working with bacteria, things that could actually make you sick. And he was trying to learn about those. But the problem with Dr. Fleming was that he was a really messy and disorganized guy. And he was also in a hurry. He was leaving for a vacation. He wanted to go out and have a break. And he left all of his bacteria plates in the lab, kind of stacked up, kind of messy and in the middle of everything. And he went away for a few weeks. And he came back. The thing was that one of his colleagues in the exact same lab was actually working on a particular uh, mold that produced uh, something called penicillin. Penicillin notatum is a fungus that produces the um, the um, uh, drug penicillin, and his colleague actually ended up contaminating Fleming's plates. It was accidental, but his penicillin, his penicillin notatum, got onto Fleming's staphylococcus plates. And when Fleming got back from his vacation and he pulled his plates out, he found that there were several plates that were just ruined. His bacteria were all dead. And that was problematic for his research because he really didn't want to kill the bacteria. He wanted to work on them. However, it w turned out to be a really good discovery. He recognized that there might be something about those penicillin, that penicillin mold that uh, allowed the death of bacteria. And maybe there could be something to this. Serendipity, coincidence. This is not telling you to leave your lab or your room or your house messy all the time. You might grow the next antibiotic. But sometimes it does happen. Discovery option number two is something that gets used a lot more today, and that's design. I told you that drugs work because they block a specific process in the body, and so what we do is we use research that we've already got about a particular disease or a particular type of cancer. What we do is we look at the disease itself. We say, in this type of tumor, it forms at this point, and these, uh, these things happen biologically. We essentially select a target. My goal is to come up with a new therapeutic for this type of cancer by blocking this function in the cancer cell. I want to keep the cancer cell from reproducing and I know that this is the place in the cell that I have to target. I look for something. The next thing you do is lead discovery. If I'm trying to keep a cancer cell from reproducing and I know the part of the cell that I have to target, I'm going to think about molecules that might fit into those enzymes that I'm trying to block. I'm looking for a small molecule that will work. Something that you also do is medicinal chemistry, right? Once I have some molecules, I'm going to test them in different places. I'm going to see what works. I'm also going to screen. I'm going to see is there anything else that uh, I can look for as well. I'm going to screen in silico maybe. I can use computers to see how my molecule might fit in with the target using computer simulations. I'm going to do structure activity studies. So I'm going to try and see whether that molecule is active in the way that I want it to be before I ever put it into a test tube. Once I've got that, once I've got a lead and once I've done some preliminary studies on it, you do what's called in vitro studies. So you work on those in uh, cells, for example. So um, you try to figure out where the drug is binding in, uh, to what enzymes in a cell or in a body. You use cellular disease models. So I get cells that are infected with a specific d disease. I dose them with the drugs to see what happens. We try to learn the mechanism of action of the drug at this point. Is it really doing what I think it's doing? Is it doing something different? What do I need to keep in, keep in mind? At this point, you're refining your lead candidate. I had a small molecule that I was thinking of at the start. I have some better ideas now that I've done some more work. And so we might make a new uh, lead molecule that's just a little bit different at this point. Once you finish the in vitro study, so in the test tube, but still in living cells, you go to the in vivo. That's where we start working on animal models. So I might give the drug to a mouse or a rabbit or a monkey and see how that works. This is where I start looking for the behavioral effects of the drug, right? Because now it's in a full organism. I can't really test the behavior of a cell. I'm not going to know in the same way. Only after all of those things get done do we ever go to clinical trials and therapeutics and the actual use of the drug. 
it can take years and decades for a new drug to get to market and the process costs billions of dollars and it's because of all of the lead up work that goes to this. This is why prescription drugs are so expensive. It's because they take years and dollars and effort to develop. There's one tool that we might want to look at that um, is involved in our uh, involved in our arsenal for making new drugs and that's combinatorial chemistry. I told you in the previous slide that part of the drug discovery process is a lead discovery, a molecule. I need a molecule to test and combinatorial chemistry helps us develop a whole bunch of molecules at once. What you're doing is you're systematically creating a large library of small molecules that you can rapidly screen as potential drugs. So I might have an idea based off of what enzymatic process I'm trying to block, what kind of molecule I want, what kind of functional groups I'm interested in, but maybe I'm not entirely sure where that functional group should be on the molecule or how I could make it or that sort of thing. Combinatorial chemistry helps me make a whole bunch of different options at once. Essentially you start with a molecule and we'll let each one of these little symbols be a different functional group and we put a fourth one on but I put it on in all of the possible places. And then I put a fifth group on. <laughs> I put a fifth group on and again I put it in all of the possible locations on the molecule, etc, etc. Every time I do a step I make all of the possible outcomes. And the reason you do this is so that you can screen a whole bunch of them at once. Instead of doing tests on one molecule and then going back and refining and doing those tests again, what you do is you make a hundred molecules and you perform the same test and you see which one out of those hundred works the best. It helps just do things more quickly. There's also some really nice synthesis systems to make all 100 of those at once, combinatorial synthesizers that uh, speed up the process and they just give you more options and more flexibility. Right, the benefits are we get a whole bunch of molecules quickly and also it's just cheaper than traditional synthesis techniques. What about the regulation of drugs? We looked at this very briefly yesterday, right? We said that there are FDA substances, or there are substances that the FDA monitors for health, and they fit into two classes. They fit into dietary supplements, which are less regulated, like your vitamins, your minerals, and your botanicals and your enzymes and your herbs. They also fit into drugs. That's actually one of the controversies, and that's one of the things that people talk about today in drug regulation. Ephedra, which uh, people promote for weight loss, and some people have used irresponsibly for weight loss, and it's even led to uh, deaths and illnesses, is not regulated like a drug. Should it be? Should it not be? It's one of those things that you have to keep in mind. Because the stricter regulation that drugs have um, comes in two areas, right? First off is... Uh, there are pioneer or prescription drugs. So remember when we saw that uh, drug design slide from our last lecture, we talked about the uh, time and effort and money that goes into developing a new drug. When that new drug is developed, it's called a pioneer prescription drug. And it's got its, uh, it's, got its patent to it. It's a patent protected drug for 20 years. That's because of so much money and time that went into it. This is the way for the company to recoup its losses in developing that drug and also to have money to put into the next great drug. Now it's a little bit misleading to call it prescription drugs. All pioneer drugs are prescription. They don't ever go over the counter. But eventually, after a certain period of time, after that patent protection has expired, drugs become generic or over the counter and that's when they become fair game for other companies to try and produce a generic version. So for example, one that went off the market in, to over the counter a few years ago was the drug Claritin or Loratadine. Claritin is the trade name from the uh, company that produces it, but there are a number of knockoffs, right? You can go buy Walletin D from Walgreens or Loratadine from CVS. They are the same drug, and in fact, to get a license from the FDA to produce a generic drug, you have to prove to them that it is bioequivalent to the Pioneer. It is the exact same loratadine molecule as in Claritin. I can't call it Claritin because that name is patent protected, but it is. You don't have to test it, right? Pioneer drugs went through a lengthy and expensive and uh, thorough testing. 
the loratadine molecule went through a huge set of tests to prove that it was good at treating the symptoms of allergy attacks as Claritin. But since the uh, generic companies are demonstrating that they have a bioequivalent drug, they have exactly the same thing, they don't have to redo that testing. If it was loratadine when they tested it as the name Claritin, it's still loratadine now. They had to spend their money in working on making the bioequivalent, making their own synthesis, all that good stuff. These are also no trade names, right? This is how you get the knockoffs at CVS. But whether you buy Claritin, whether you buy Wallatin, whether you buy Loratadine, they are exactly the same drug, and the FDA has made sure that they definitely are. On the other hand, on the diet supplementary side, we don't know exactly what's in there. It's not regulated in the same way, and it's not regulated as stringently, and you have to be very, very careful with that.